Okay, folks. Uh, today, I hope to finish up talking about the static Malthusian model in all of its details. Uh, and I have to do that because we're actually falling behind a little bit. Uh, because then we're going to see that there's going to be some interesting dynamism in this Malthusian world that's because of a connection, a close connection between the ideas of Malthus and those of Darwin. Uh, but first, we have to uh, finish up talking about uh, fertility. What's the shape of this schedule in the pre-industrial world? And then mortality. Right? And do we really observe this crossing of these uh, schedules? And what I mentioned was that the place that we have some of the best demographic evidence for is England from 1540 onwards and France also from 1540 onwards. Because of legal requirements that were set in place in both countries at that date, that the local parish priest had to maintain a register of all baptisms, uh, all buried, burials, and all marriages. And so we, uh, because of the extensive history of demographic investigation, uh, they've been able to reconstruct the entire population history of a number of British parishes starting in the late uh, 16th century and also a number of French parishes. Well, you can actually go through and calculate exactly what happened in this parish uh, over a course of 300 or 400 years. And so that gives us a lot of demographic uh, information. And then with all of these parish registers, there's something like 9,000 parishes in England. Now, it turns out not all of the priests were very diligent in keeping these records. Uh, some of them would just stop for years or else only partially record people. Many of these records were lost, but enough of them survive that they can then actually calculate aggregate birth rates and death rates in England in every year from about uh, 1540 uh, onwards. So we have this wealth of information for a society like England. And what's troubling for the Malthusian model is in that aggregate information, we'll see that there's going to be no evidence that either fertility or mortality responded to levels of income. Uh, fertility, and, and the way we can look at fertility and income is we can look at periods when incomes were high versus periods where incomes were low. There's simply no correlation between birth rates and those variations over 10 or 20 years in income levels. And then we also get very big annual shocks to income. And again, we could say, is there any response of either uh, fertility or what we think of would be, do people delay marriages, for example, in years where uh, uh, harvests are very bad? And again, the answer is there's very little sign of any response here. And so it makes it look as though that this schedule is just going to be flat. More troubling will be the question about what about this death rate schedule? If they're both flat, then the question would be, well, what's maintaining the equilibrium in this pre-industrial world? That's what we get looking at the aggregate evidence. Now, previously, these parish records didn't seem to permit us to look at fertility or mortality in cross-section across individuals because the priest just recorded the name of the person. Uh, they didn't record any of the details of how much wealth they had, what occupation they had, anything else like that. And so uh, it would seem that it wouldn't be able to learn anything about individual level fertility and income uh, looking at these records. But it turns out there's another activity that the church carried out, which was to register people's wills. And so what we can actually do is from a will, we can figure out the occupation of a person and also how much stuff they had. And there's a huge variation in these pre-industrial societies in terms of how wealthy people are at the time of death. And so what we can do then is if we link up the wills to the parish registers, there's only a certain number we can do that for, we can then get a picture of people's fertility, mortality, lined up with their income in this pre-industrial society. Uh, and by the way, w uh, just as a side note, the reason that it's possible to do that, to do it from my office in California, is because of the incredible genealogical activity of the Mormon church. For various theological reasons, the Mormon church wants to identify everyone who's ever lived who could potentially be identified. 
Uh, and so they have actually created for England, out of these local parish registers, a website where I can find someone's name in a will, type it into this free website, and it will tell you uh, all of the children that were registered, uh, born to that person, or the date of marriage, if it exists. Uh, and it turns out that uh, that might be pretty tough, except that uh, in England, there's a lot of very common names, Smith, Clark, that are held by a lot of people. But it turns out there's a lot of very unusual uh, English names. Uh, and uh, what you can then find is people w with, with names that only 10 or 20 people <laughs> hold in any generation. And so it's relatively easy to track them to the parish records because the name is uh, simply so unusual. And we're actually going to use that. There's, I've done a lot of stuff since the book came out looking at pre-industrial England and social mobility. And so in a few uh, lectures' time, I'm going to show you we can use these names to actually trace unusual names to trace social mobility over 300 or 400 or 500 years in something like uh, pre-industrial society. But for the moment, what we have then is we have measures of uh, people's wealth from the wills, and then we have measures from the parish registers of their nuptiality and fertility. And what's the answer? The answer is, looking in cross-section across people, there's a strong positive relation between the birth rate and people's wealth. So that if you actually take cross-sections of poor and wealthy uh, male testators, we have to use men because men hold all the property in this society, you get this very strong uh, association. And in fact, if we divide the will makers up into quartiles, that is the bottom 25%, the middle 25%, and then the top 25%, so this will be the quartile, And we look at the number of births that corresponds to each testator. We find it's 3.8 for the, the poorest ones, 4.8, 5.0, 6.0. And so you see that there's actually this nice pattern <laughs> where rich men uh, uh, um, are responsible for a lot of births and uh, poor men, poorer men are responsible for fewer. But the important thing is, remember, these are will makers. So, so the guys who are the poorest here are still in the upper half of the income distribution in the society, most likely. Okay? But many of these people are leaving very modest amounts, a few cows, some plates, uh, some work tools, uh, not a lot of stuff. The richest guys here will be leaving 100 acres of land, many houses, uh, lots of assets. And you get this nice association. The puzzling thing is, well, where's that coming from? And it turns out that it's mainly not, a little bit is because rich men marry more frequently. So that's one of the effects in terms of the European marriage pattern. Um, they marry, they seem to marry slightly younger women. <laughs> so that's another effect that's going to increase fertility. But that effect is very, very minor. But if you look at the birth spacing, again, using these records, the parish records, we can say, what's the space between the first and the second birth? Right? You can't use the first birth after marriage because a lot of the brides are pregnant before they enter marriage. But if we look at the spacing between the first and the second birth, it gives us an idea of how frequently are births occurring within the marriage. And the answer is, it's the same for the rich and the poor. It fulfills this pattern where it seems that once you get married, you just have children. There's no limitation. So why are rich men having more children than uh, poor men? Uh, the answer is mainly because their wives continue to have births longer than for the wives of uh, poorer men. It's just the, the, the span of fertility is greater for the wives of richer men than poorer men. And I don't understand <laughs> Uh, what, why that's such a prominent effect and what it means, right? Uh, one thing might be that it would be um, a reflection of contraceptive choices, which would be that uh, basically uh, poor women would stop having children earlier. But in that case, you would expect the spacing to lengthen for the children of uh, poor women than of uh, uh, richer women. 
and you don't see any sign of that, right? But it turns out that it, it is there in the data that in cross-section, you do get this strong response of fertility uh, to income. And what we'll actually see is we can use the same kind of data to look at what happens to mortality with income because in these wills, men at their death tend to leave property to all of their children in England. And we have from the parish records the records of all the children that were born to them. And so then we've got the date of the will, the date of the births. We can actually track well, how many of their children survived till the time of the will and actually calculate what's mortality incidence like for rich as opposed to poor in this pre-industrial world. And what we'll actually see is that you again, you do observe this downward slope. That richer men end up uh, uh, having children who survive better than poorer men. But the odd thing is that when we look at the, the, the net fertility advantage we'll see of the rich as opposed to the poor, the numbers of surviving children, it's quite strong. It's about double for the richest men as opposed to the poorest men. It's actually still mainly coming from fertility. Mortality is actually only explaining a relatively small share of that uh, gap. And so that's, it's an odd feature, but it turns out in cross-section in England, it, the, it, you get all the elements that you would expect from this Malthusian model. And the puzzle is why it doesn't in any way show up then in the time series evidence, why periods of low wages and low incomes are not associated with the general declines in fertility and general increases in mortality in England. Because as I say, the pattern in cross-section is uh, very strong. Um, that English pattern of much greater fertility for the rich, it turns out that that is not observed if we go to pre-industrial China. That there's actually, in pre-industrial China, there's very modest gains in terms of fertility for rich people as opposed to poor people, right? And so it, it's something that's very strong in pre-industrial Europe, but it has, it has relatively modest effects in terms of fertility when we go to somewhere like China. How do we know that for China? Well, it... Recent work, again, as I say, we, we know so much more in 2009 about these things than we did 20 years ago that it's amazing how much uh, new material is emerging about this uh, pre-industrial uh, issues. Um, but what's been done for China is the source there is these uh, uh, family lineages. It's these books that are preserved in family temples that record the history of particular clans in China. And you know that in China, there's a, a lot of reverence for ancestors, and there's a lot of desire to maintain the continuity, the lineage of the clans uh, in a way that you don't get in, in Europe. Uh, and so that we have these records then, and for some of these families, it, they extend back to 1300 in China, all the way up to 1800. And so uh, what uh, Carol Shu from uh, uh, University of Colorado at Boulder has, has done recently in a paper that's not yet published is to classify sons within this genealogy and group them, first of all, the ones who have no... How do we measure their status? They're the ones who have no title, right? They have no honors. They have no distinctions. They're just... It's the regular Joes... <laughs> of pre-industrial China. And then there's a group that have some titles. There's a group that are near gentry. And there's a group that she classifies as gentry. And so unlike uh, the English data, you can't actually get a measure of their full economic uh, you know, uh, uh, position, that is their wealth. We can just get some rough idea of their social status based on there's nothing distinguished about them in the genealogy. There's some kind of local, they became a magistrate or had some kind of local distinction. These guys had many more titles. And then the very upper class of these are ones who do very well on the imperial exams and uh, uh, become high officials in the Chinese government. And so we can classify them in this way. And then we can just look at how many sons are recorded in these genealogies as being born to men in each group. And remember, we have to use the sons because of female infanticide. 
so that not all the daughters who were born would actually make it into the genealogy. And when we do that, we find that those with no title have 1.95 sons. So that implies that they're giving birth, their wives are giving birth to about four children. Okay? And so that's uh, the total births. And then some titles, it's 2.17, near gentry, 2.33, gentry, 2.04. And so what you actually see in China is the fertility response to status and income is surprisingly muted. Uh, rich men are not using their position and income to have very large numbers of children in this society. Whereas in England, the richest men are ending up with something like five surviving children. In something like England. Here, if you just look at births, the richest men are still giving birth to only about four children in these genealogies. Right? Now, there's a problem that not all the sons may be recorded. If you're a particularly undistinguished son, if you die very young, uh, it may be that there's incomplete recording here. But it's interesting that there isn't very strong effect. Uh, there's some effect, but not very strong. The next thing, though, you, these genealogies record also is the number of wives. Remember, this is a society where if you're richer, you could end up with more wives. The poorest men have an average here of one wife. <laughs> right. uh, and so th they don't uh, uh, get uh, second wives. But as you move up the social rank here, richer men, one of the things that they do show up is having multiple wives in this society. Uh, what about the numbers of sons per wife then? So here it's 1.95. 1.41, 1.61, and 1.62. And so what's actually happening is the richest men, because they have more wives, the wives actually produce fewer children each. And so the interesting thing is, for some reason, in these Chinese uh, uh, upper-class uh, families, uh, rich men actually do show up as you think potentially they would have many more children. But once you have more wives, the fertility of the wives actually falls here. And so there is actually this very kind of muted response to uh, income in Chinese society. And so one of the interesting puzzles we'll see when we come on and talk about Malthus and Darwin is, is there a different social dynamic going on in Asia as opposed to Europe in the pre-industrial period? Because what we'll see is happening in Europe is that the economically successful are producing a flood of children within those societies. And because they're static societies, we'll see that those children are going to have to be moving steadily down the social hierarchy. Right? And that there's a, an interesting social dynamic there where downward mobility is going to be the dominant feature of those societies. Whereas in both Japan and in China, the rich are slightly more fertile than the poor. But essentially, they are not producing all of these surplus children who have to find a living in some other way than remaining in the landed class or remaining in the bureaucratic class. And the interesting question would be, is that having an effect in terms of how open these economies are, how much they're changing, how much people's attitudes are changing as we move towards the Industrial Revolution? So the last thing we need to do in terms of just the static model is to say a little bit about uh, Chapter 5, which is uh, death rates here. And here, the first thing we just want to look at is, again, this question, were there any gains from the arrival of settled agriculture? What was Europe like as opposed to Asia in terms of living standards on the eve of the Industrial Revolution? And the way we can study that is by two measures. One is E0, which is how many years you can expect to live at birth in each of these societies. Now, what I've argued is that E0 is actually not, in some ways, the best measure we have of living conditions. Because if you die in infancy, in some sense, you have less, you know, if we were to choose which society we wanted to land in, and there's one where we learn, well, a lot of people die in infancy, 
we'd say, well, I'm maybe not so concerned about that. I'm concerned about once I become an adult, once I get a stake in this society, how much longer can I expect to live? And so a second measure is E20, which is what's life expectancy when you reach age 20? How many more years can you expect to live in this world by the time you reach 20? Okay? And the first group then is, well, what about the, the hunter-gatherers? Okay? So we get these studies of modern hunter-gatherers where people go and try and figure out what the ages of people are, what rates people are dying at. Uh, and there's a whole group of these uh, populations that have been studied. And the answer is that for hunter-gatherers, <coughs> the median life expectancy at birth is about 32 years, 33 years. Okay? So it's not terrible. And the interesting thing for hunter-gatherers is that the median life expectancy at age 20 is 40 years. What does that mean? It means that in these groups, you have greater life expectancy at age, remaining years life expectancy at age 20 than you do at birth. By surviving the hazards of childhood and infancy, you get rewarded with this. You've now been revealed as a tough one. <laughs> And so you have this higher life expectancy. And the interesting thing about that is that in these groups living in the forest with all kinds of dangers, they're moving all the time, uh, they're quite violent, these societies, uh, it's still the case that without any medical treatment, on average, someone who makes it to 20 will make it to 60. Right? A bunch of these guys would be able to draw Social Security benefits in the United States uh, if they were entitled to them without any medical treatment. And so that's what we expect for the Stone Age, is that life expectancy at something like 20 may actually be not that dramatically different than it is in the modern world. Right? Life expectancy at birth is very low, but because a lot of the excess mortality occurs in infancy, life expectancy at more adult ages is greater. Right? And we'll see one reflection of that is that there's a study that's been done from 1500 to 1750 in Europe of uh, the age of death of notable scientific and philosophical figures. And on average, those guys died at age 66, which as I say, it's less. I mean, now we're very close to 80 in terms of life expectancy at birth. But in a world without effective medicine, it's surprisingly high. Though there's a bias in that study, which is you only become a famous scientist or philosopher if you live long enough <laughs> to actually complete the work that's going to make you famous. But it, it does turn out in the pre-industrial period there are lots of quite old people. And so in particular, for example, Isaac Newton, one of the greatest physicists who ever lived, lived till 85 uh, in pre-industrial in, in, and was born in, in uh, 17th century England. Uh, Voltaire, the French philosopher, lived till a uh, writer, lived till 83. Immanuel Kant, the Prussian philosopher, again in the 18th century, lived till 80. Uh, and so uh, it's an interesting feature of the society that there are some people who actually live to very substantial ages. And the upper age, from this English data, we can get calculations of kind of the upper end of the age distribution. It's around about 90, 95. So it's actually not that far from the maximal ages that we're now able to, to, to reach. And as I say, it's amazing that these people have no effective medical interventions, right? That it's quite possible to actually live 80 or 90 years in this society, if you're lucky, uh, without any interventions of any kind. So that's hunter-gatherers. What happens then if we go to uh, Western Europe around 1800? Uh, life expectancy there actually varies a lot across different societies, but it's in that range of 28 to 38. So England, it's quite high. It's close to 38. France, it's quite low in the 18th century. 17th century, it's down about 28. But the interesting thing is it's right in that hunter-gatherer range. Right? There's no difference between them and hunter-gatherers. And life expectancy at 40 is about 32 and so it actually shows a somewhat different pattern in pre-industrial Europe, which is that infancy is less dangerous <laughs> in these societies. But consequently, by the time you get to age 20, you actually have lower remaining life expectancy than you would if you were a hunter-gatherer. 
right? And so you have these somewhat different patterns across different societies. So where Europe, for some reason, <coughs> infancy and childhood are relatively low mortality rates compared to other pre-industrial societies. And so that means that uh, life expectancy in adulthood is actually relatively modest. And then we've got East Asia and China, Japan, life expectancy at birth seems to be about 30. So again, it's a little bit less than Europe and hunter-gatherers, but they're all in a very similar range. And again, in East Asia, life expectancy at 20 is actually better than it is in Europe. And the reason for that is, remember, there's a lot of female infanticide in Asia, and so there's very high death rates amongst infants. And that means that if you make it out of infancy with this overall life expectancy of 30, it must imply that you actually have pretty high life expectancy. Okay? And so, as it confirms the general conclusion, there's no sign of any gains in the world up till 1800 compared to the original hunter-gatherers. There's not any real sign here of differences between Europe and Asia. Uh, and the other important thing is that all of these societies have life expectancies that are much greater than you would expect with completely unrestricted fertility. Because remember, life expectancy at birth is going to be one over the birth rate. A life expectancy of 33 corresponds to a birth rate of about 30 per thousand. And so that's what we think, and that the birth rate in the pre-industrial, these pre-industrial societies is. We observe, looking at, say, modern sub-Saharan Africa, that it's possible, under conditions of natural fertility, to get up to birth rates that are close to 60 per thousand. And so if there had been just unrestricted fertility in this pre-industrial world, then life expectancy at birth would have been less than 20. And so the important thing is that all of these societies are actually restricting in some way their fertility. They're avoiding about half of all potential births. And that's actually what's keeping life expectancy low as it is. It could actually be a lot lower in these societies, but it's actually being kept relatively high by this restriction on uh, fertility. Um, the other thing in terms of life expectancy is What's the society with the, the lowest life expectancy in the pre-industrial world? Question here. What is the birth rate for the birth rate? Oh, sorry, that's the birth rate. So this thing here is 0 0.03. Yeah? So what does that stand for? Like, what is it per thousand? It's 30 births per th every thousand in the population. Every year? Every year, oh. yeah. Sorry. So the question there was, what, <laughs> apparently I hadn't explained, what is a birth rate? <laughs> And so the crude birth rate in any society is just the number of births per year divided by the population. Okay? And so that's just one simple measure we have of fertility rates across societies. It's not a pr an ideal measure because it depends on the age structure of the population. For modern, highly developed societies, that birth rate is down to 10 or less right, per thousand. Okay? And so pre-industrial world, there are many more births per person in the population. Uh, and as I say, it turns out that that birth rate in this Malthusian world, in the end, is what determines life expectancy. Okay? And as long as that birth rate is high, life expectancy has to be low. So one of the key elements of living conditions is just going to be determined by what's the birth rate in this society. Okay? Uh, and so what I was saying here is, well, here's the record for life expectancy. Where's the very lowest life expectancies that we can find and the answer for the pre-industrial world is actually in London. In London before 1800, life expectancy at birth was roughly 23. Uh, and that's about the lowest that you'll actually observe in any of these pre-industrial societies. And so it, it's a feature of Europe that cities, at least, are deadly locations uh, with these very low life expectancies at birth. Now, um, What's the record in terms of income and mortality? That is the shape of this slope. I've already gone through that and said that you just don't see a lot of aggregate response in a society like England in the pre-industrial period to economic changes in terms of the death rate. Uh, harvest shocks don't kill large numbers of people in England 
except the last one that really had a devastating effect was 1315 to 17. And what actually happened in that instance was there were two successive very bad harvests, just by random chance. And people survived the first one, but then they were just didn't have enough stored up to survive the second one. And that killed about 10% of the population. But in general in England, when you see these year-to-year fluctuations, they have very modest effects on death rates. And again, when you go from periods with low levels of income to periods with higher levels of income, again, there's very little sign of much effect on death rates. But if you take these people in cross-section and just look at how many of their children who are born will survive to adulthood, then what you find is that... Um, now let me just give you a little bit of data on this. I don't want to overwhelm you with numbers. So... We want to look just at what percentage of children born to various men in pre-industrial England actually survive to age 25. Okay. So typically, men writing wills do this around about, they're dying about age 55 or 60. And so at that stage, they get married about age 27 on average. And so some of their children will already be 25 by the time they die or 30 by the time they die. So you get pretty good measures of what children's ability to survive uh, to ages 25 is in this society. And then let's just look at the poorest men and the richest. So this is the bottom 25% of testators and the top 25%. So, and remember, the, the bottom 25% is still amongst the, the wealthier men in the society. And here we actually have to split it up by location. And so, first of all, there's men who lived on a farm. So their will reveals that they lived in the countryside and they're actually out on a farm somewhere in the countryside. And the answer is that for the poorest men, roughly two-thirds of their children born are still alive at age 25. And for the richest men in this environment, about 75% of the children have actually made it to age 25. So they actually have, in the rural areas, uh, you get this advantage still, uh, but survival rates are actually very good in the pre-industrial period. And then there's farm, and then there's people who live out in the countryside in villages, but who would be carpenters or, you know, so they're actually living in the villages out in the countryside. And you see there that they have just slightly lower survival rates. <laughs> so the safest place is on a farm. If you go to a village, it gets a little less safe. And then there's people who live in towns. So these would be modest towns of 5,000 or 10,000 people. Um, and again, it's 59 to 63. So what you see is that your survival rates are actually dropping. <coughs> but in all of these locations the richest men have more of their children surviving than the poorest men, right? That there is this advantage to wealth. And then last of all, you have London, which by the 18th century is a giant city of about a million people, right? And very deadly. And here, for the poorest, the survival rate is 40%. And for the richest, the survival rate is 44%. So you really see this incredible gradient in terms of urban locations in the pre-industrial world. And only two-fifths of all children born. And so less than half the children born amongst the wealthy here are actually surviving in a city like uh, London. There's another odd effect in this data, which again, I don't understand why. But for some reason, in rural areas, boys survive better than girls. <laughs> in London, there's a big significant premium to the survival of girls as opposed to boys. For some reason, cities were particularly deadly to men <laughs> in the pre-industrial period. And we'll come actually talk about this about, uh, we'll come back to this because it turns out that cities seem to have had a large premium in terms of numbers of women living in cities in the pre-industrial era so that they had effects on controlling, uh, on, on driving up living standards in two ways. And, and one was that they drove up the death rate and that that helps in terms of living standards. 
But the second was that they may also have significantly reduced the birth rate by creating these gender imbalances so that a lot of women in cities couldn't find someone to marry. Right? And a lot of men in the countryside couldn't find someone to marry as well because there's this mislocation of men and women in the pre-industrial world. And so uh, the overall effect then is that uh, you can definitely, again, in cross-section, actually see this Malthusian model. It's just that you can't see it in terms of uh, time series, in terms of going from year to year. But, but the evidence is there in the cross-sectional data. Now, in terms of uh, mortality, the questions that we have are, first of all, well, why was Europe so rich in the pre-industrial world? it doesn't seem that Europe had any advantage in terms of limiting fertility compared to Asia. So if it was going to be so rich, a large contribution would have to be that somehow Europe had higher death rates than Asia at the same living standards. And uh, the question is, uh, uh, why were death rates so high in pre-industrial Europe? Well, it turns out in the period 1348 to the 1660s, the nice advantage that Europe had was the Black Death, which was raging all across Europe in this period and which maintained very high living standards in early Europe. And one of the important things uh, about the Black Death is that uh, it's really not very well understood why it eventually disappeared from Europe in the 1660s because there's not much sign that people had actually acquired immunity to the bacterium. Uh, and so the later outbreaks tend to kill as many people who get infected as the earliest outbreaks did. So it's not clear that there was any kind of acquired immunity in the population as a whole to the Black Death. But what we actually think is that it's likely due to improvements in hygiene <laughs> in Europe in this period because the crucial vector that this disease requires is that people be living in close proximity to rats. And so in early medieval Europe, it's the vermin, it's the rats who are actually helping to transmit the disease to humans. It's when they die out that the fleas then move to humans. And so it just reflects the very poor hygiene of earlier pre-industrial Europe. And one of the things that's happening as you move into the 17th century, for example, is that housing materials are changing. And they're moving more towards brick houses uh, and, and less towards thatched housing. Uh, and all of that helps to kind of keep down the rat population in towns and cities and the countryside. And so the interesting thing is that that advantage in the medieval period may well owe to very <coughs> poor standards of hygiene. When we come to the later period, one of the big advantages that uh, Netherlands and England have is very high rates of urbanization. Because, as we've seen, the cities are deadly. Uh, London, on its own, is driving up the death rate in England by about 10% uh, every year. And so the cities are supplying this important boost to the death rate schedules in Western Europe. And these end up being relatively highly urbanized societies. So the Netherlands, by 1800, 35 to 40 percent of people are living in cities in the Netherlands. In England, by 1800, it's 25 percent. And so the nice thing is that in the earlier period, you have the plague, which is keeping up living standards. In the 17th century, as the plague is beginning to disappear, cities are growing greatly in terms of their size in uh, Western Europe. And that increase in cities is actually immediately having this effect in terms of driving up death rates because of the very, very poor hygiene. Uh, within cities. <coughs> and then another advantage that at least the Netherlands had <coughs> in terms of keeping up mortality rates was its colonial adventures. So uh, in 1602, the Dutch set up the Dutch East India Company, the VOC. Uh, that company recruited about a million men between 1602 and 1795 when it was abolished. Right? And remember, the Netherlands, this period, is a, a country with a population of about 2.5 million people in total. And so the Dutch East India Company actually absorbed a large fraction of the population of males in the Netherlands, or certainly a large, a significant fraction. 
And what that company is doing is exploiting the Dutch colonies in the East Indies, defending them and bringing back the products of the East Indies. And so the Netherlands gains enormous amounts from its control of Indonesia and enormous amounts of income from the control of the spice trade uh, from Indonesia. Uh, it took all of these men, and it's estimated that about half of those men died in the course of service to the Dutch East India Company. And so there were about 35,000 male births in the Netherlands from 1,600 to 1,800 a year. About 5,000 of those people were consumed in deaths in East India Company service. And so it drove up the death rate in the Netherlands amongst males by about um, 14% in this period, just the existence of the Dutch East India Company. Uh, and one of the secondary effects it had was to create a shortage of men in Dutch cities. And so that in Amsterdam in the 18th century, there's 1.3 women for every man. And because of this marriage pattern in Europe, where it's one man to one woman, <laughs> right? Un unlike in China, uh, where men can have uh, multiple wives, uh, what happens then in the cities is that in the Netherlands, a large fraction of women in the cities, and that's a large share of the population, simply never marry. And so in Amsterdam, around about 1800, it's estimated that about a quarter of all women in the city simply never married in this period. And so the very high incomes, as I say, of Western Europe then seem to owe to this uh, combination of factors. Um, there's high rates of urbanization. That consumes people. In places like the Netherlands, there are these colonial adventures. That consumes men, which won't directly drive down population growth, but it results in large numbers of women being left without potential husbands, and that again then limits the fertility in the society. And then the third factor is just the general low standards of hygiene uh, in Western Europe compared to Asia. And one measure we have of standards of hygiene is, well, we can actually measure in places like England what soap consumption per person per year was all the way back till about 1700. The reason we can do that is that the British government taxed soap. And so there was a specific soap tax. Uh, and so you can actually measure what consumption per person was. And the answer is, for England in the 18th century, is that the average person consumed a fifth of an ounce of soap per day. Uh, that's pretty small because that soap has to both wash clothes, people, other things. Soap actually also serves as a grease for axle wheels and stuff uh, like that in this period. It's used as an industrial grease. It's used in industrial processes. It's actually an astonishingly small amount of soap. How do we know it's really low? Uh, Australian convicts in the 19th century were given a ration of half an ounce of soap a day. Uh, in the Civil War armies in the United States in the 1860s, both sides gave about two-thirds of an ounce per day to their soldiers. And so we actually know that things like soap consumption are very low in pre-industrial Europe. And so, as I say, it's, it seems to be this combination of factors rather than any technological advantage that's actually leading to these relatively high living standards in Europe uh, compared to other parts of the world. Now, one other puzzle in terms of death rates is, well, we see that living standards in Asia were very low. We see that in hunter-gatherer society, living standards were relatively high, but then we'll see that these were pretty violent societies, so they had their own source of mortality, and they also limited fertility very severely. There is this one remaining puzzle, which is why was Polynesia such a paradise when the Europeans arrived in the 1760s? Because when the Europeans got there, the Polynesians are tall, they're healthy, but it's a society that seemingly would have a very high birth rate because there's very widespread and very open sexual activity. What shocked the Europeans was that the Hawaiians would just, uh, in the middle of a meal or something like that, uh, two people would just have sex in front of the rest of the company. I mean, it was so uninhibited. Uh, that uh, they, there was no even demand for privacy in the course of sex, and it started as soon as people reached puberty. Uh, and so, as I say, that's why the European sailors thought they had arrived in, in the most uh, wonderful of paradises, because the people are handsome, they're beautiful, they're incredibly sexually active, and the European sailors now are rich people in this society compared to poor people in the society they came from.
But it raises this puzzle, which is, how could life be so good in Polynesia? And this puzzle is emphasized by when we get mortality rates for European troops stationed around the world in the 19th century. Okay? And these mortality rates are in terms of how many of these troops per thousand who are stationed in any place died in a particular year. And so if we look at the 19th century, we have Tahiti, which actually was occupied by the French, and it has a mortality rate of 10 per thousand. As a kind of baseline, there's British troops stationed in Canada, and this is outside wartime conditions. So this is all mortality that doesn't come from armed conflict. They have a mortality rate of about 16 per thousand. We can contrast that with <clears throat> what about British troops that were sent to Bombay in India? Their mortality rate was about 37 per thousand. Now, that's very high because remember, what's, what are average mortality rates for pre-industrial populations going to be? For the general population, it'll typically be about 30 or 40 per thousand. But these are all adults here, these troops that are stationed here. And so a lot of the mortality is actually going to be children in these societies. So 37 per thousand for young men <laughs> is actually a very high mortality rate. Okay? And so these rates look reasonable. These rates start looking high. So we think that places like India are relatively unhealthy. If we go to the East Indies, that is, if we go to Indonesia, mortality rates for troops per year there were 170 per thousand. So that meant that the Dutch soldiers who went to Indonesia, about a fifth of them almost are dying every year that they're on station there. And that's, as I say, why the, the, the Dutch East India Company is just consuming this huge number of male Dutch. It's because of these very high mortality rates in its main focus of operations. And then West Africa, so Sierra Leone, what was the mortality rates of British troops there? It was 483 per thousand. That meant that the troops who were shipped out there in the 19th century to the coast of West Africa, a half of them were dying each year. <laughs> right? This is much worse than combat losses, even in major wars now. Right? And so the interesting thing is we get from this data this idea that in the pre-industrial world, there really were very unhealthy places. <laughs> there were places that were disastrously unhealthy to be. Uh, a lot of these places here, what's important is the mosquito as a vector of various diseases. What was great about Tahiti was it didn't have mosquitoes. Right? It has a very balmy climate, but you can see it's a paradise compared to this part of the world here. But the puzzle is, in terms of the Malthusian world, it should have been one of the poorest places in the world, Tahiti. It should have been a place of incredibly low living standards because disease is not killing people, so they're all going to have to die from very low consumption standards. And so it is actually this great puzzle, which is, is it a violation of the Malthusian model, <laughs> what was happening in Tahiti? Does it show that the model doesn't apply? Or is there some other explanation for these very high living standards? And it turns out that our best bet <laughs> is that these living standards in Tahiti were actually created by violence within the society. And that violence took two forms. Uh, when Captain Cook and the other early explorers came there, the, the, the puzzling thing is they don't mention this. But when the English discovered this Pacific paradise, with people engaging in this kind of riotous life, uh, their first thought was that these people needed uh, Christian missionaries. Uh, and so the London Missionary Society actually arrived in Tahiti in 1797. And what the missionaries report is that there was actually a widespread practice of infanticide in Tahiti. And that somewhere between two-thirds and three-quarters of all children were killed immediately on birth. And they were either smothered, strangled, or had their necks broken. <laughs> uh, and that this was the kind of the dark side to paradise was that they were effectively creating their own very high mortality rates in someone like Tahiti. And the amazing thing in the mission report is that if the child survived that first day, it was treated with the utmost kindness, and that they were very fond of children, but that first day was deadly, and that there just was this, this social practice of infanticide. And then the second thing about Tahiti is 
that there were periodically quite murderous wars between different factions on the island. And so uh, when the Europeans arrived, allegedly there had been before then a sustained period of conflict where the losers were all wiped out in that conflict, and that then allows you to have, again, relatively high living standards. But the interesting thing is that <clears throat> it really is the case. You can either have good living conditions because of nature's mortality, or it turns out you have to create socially your own high mortality rates if you're going to maintain very high living standards in the pre-industrial world. Okay, um, what I'll be going on to talk to next time is Malthus and Darwin, so that'll be chapter six. But for the midterm, which is coming up on Friday, then we'll just go to the end of chapter four in terms of what will be covered. And then Nick, four times in section this week, will go over the practice midterm, will go over and answer your questions, and so make sure you go to the section this week. <laughs>